Okay, so hello uh, and welcome to uh, the last two sessions. Thank you for surviving until this time. Uh, so what we had yesterday, we were talking about a special type of infinite words called scattered countable orderings. Uh, and uh, 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 we showed that uh, these uh, kinds of infinite words, they have their notion of algebra, a special type of monoid generalized with a uh, more powerful, uh, with, with a generalized multiplication operation. And uh, so that was this, this structure. And then this was not, the, defining this generalized structure didn't really depend on the fact that we're talking about countable and scattered simultaneously. This could make sense for other kinds of infinite words. But the fact that we're talking specifically about countably scattered words was used in this part where there was the Hausdorff theorem which gave us a characterization. And here it, it was important that we made these two assumptions. And now what I want to show is uh, using a Ramsey argument, I want to say that uh, these algebras can be represented in a finite way uh, and uh, manipulated such that one can eventually prove decidability of MSO. Okay, so this is what I want to do now. And uh, what we're going, so this is going to be the, the third part of, of the countably scattered monoids. Uh, and for this, I introduced some notation, which was already done uh, even yesterday, but I'll do it once again. Suppose you have an element of the monoid. Uh, I will write m to the power of omega to, um, for the element you get by, if you take the chain, which is m, 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 this is one, a legal chain, and then you, as like to any chain labeled by m, you can apply the multiplication operation, and you get some element. So I will write, I will call this m to the omega. And here's the theorem, it says the, which we will say that it's, uh, this, is this and similar things are the only thing you need to know. It says the following thing. Suppose I have a finite monoid, generalized, and I have a homomorphism, okay? And I want to know what is the, this is not necessarily surjective. So maybe there are some values in this monoid which cannot be achieved uh, which are not in the image of H. And I want to know what is the image of H, okay? And this theorem will give me a characterization. It says that the image is, can be obtained essentially by a fixed point arg algorithm in the following way. So the image is the smallest subset which contains clearly the letters have to be there. Well, the empty chain has to be there. It has to be closed under and all you need to close it under is binary concatenation, forward omega uh, power and backward omega power. So this is the result that I want to show now. And then from that we will take some, uh, some corollaries. One of these I can des describe straight away. It's the following, and this is what the end of the proof is going to be. But I, I do it now as well just so that you know where this is going. Uh, we will apply this to the homomorphism H which assigns to a uh, countably scattered chain, it's MSO type. We mentioned that it's a compositional function, therefore this is a homomorphism. Okay? And the, if you apply this theorem, it will tell you if you want to know the image, and the image is going to be the realizable MS, MSO types of actual chains, then what all you need to do is you need to know what are the MSO types of single letters, and this can be computed in a certain way, and then you, can, you need to close it under binary concatenation and these two operations. So you collect, the, uh, you, you collect uh, MSO types that can be realized by chains, and you begin with those which correspond to the empty chain and those that belong to empty uh, single letters, and you close it under these operations. And this gives you an algorithm. Now, if you would ask me about the details of this algorithm, it's a little bit uh, non-specific, vague, uh, because I didn't say exactly about the computability things. I don't say how do you represent these MSO types. And uh, so this can be dealt with. It's not such a big deal. I didn't say how you multiply them. And I didn't say especially, and this requires a little bit of understanding how you take the omega power of types. But this can all be done. It's not such a big deal. And therefore, uh, uh, if, you, if you have that, then we will get the final result. But let's prove this here. Uh, Maybe before we prove it, 
uh, let's take the following corollary. It says that a finite monoid of this type is uniquely specified by the multiplication tables of these three operations. One binary and uh, two of them uh, being uh, two of them unary. Technically speaking, there's also the constant for the empty element. Okay? Why is that? So here it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a very generic category theory style of proof. So suppose that we have two monoids which have the same universe and which agree on these operations and have the same empty element. Okay? I claim that they actually have the same multiplication operation. So you cannot, you cannot, you can, if you know this, you can extend it to a complete multiplication operation in at most one way. Maybe you cannot extend it at all. So why is that? Consider the homomorphism which goes from chains over this common universe to pairs of chains, so to, uh, to, 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 to pairs, and the universe is the same, so this is M and M twice. What it does is it inputs a chain and it multiplies it in the first monoid and multiplies it in the second monoid. Okay? A very natural homomorphism. If I apply the theorem, then the theorem tells me that the image of this homomorphism is the smallest subset of M times M, which contains the single letters, is closed under binary uh, multiplication, and omega and reverse omega power. Yes? But these algebraic structures were assumed to give the same result for these things. So if you start with the uh, individual letters, you get uh, pairs of the form M comma M. If you start with individual letters, you get pairs of the form M comma M, and then if you multiply... Why, why, why it's so... So why only M comma M? Why, why don't you get M comma M? So it's a good point. So there is uh, I, there's something about the multiplication operation that I never uh, formally said, which is used here, and thanks for pointing it out. So if you remember the multiplication operation of an algebra, was something like this, yes? So there are two axioms that it should satisfy. One of them is the associativity axiom that was, that's the main thing. But there's another axiom which is a kind of hidden, which is that if you multiply a chain which happens to be like a trivial one element chain, then it should give, a, that's a, so this is something that one can forget. And this is actually what we're using here. So if we start off with the single letters, we will get pairs of the form M comma M by this axiom. So thanks for catching this out. And then if we multiply such pairs and take their omega powers, we will only get the diagonal all the time. So by applying that theorem, we know that the image of this homomorphism is going to be contained in the diagonal. Actually, it's going to be equal to the diagonal. And therefore, these two algebras have the same multiplication operation. And you see, it's completely generic, this proof. I mean, it doesn't depend on the fact that we have these type of operations. Yes? It's, uh, uh, it just says that if, if you have a theorem of this form, then whatever you have here, it's enough to specify, specify the multiplication table. Okay? So an algebra, what, a, what, what, what we will have corollary of this result is that uh, an, uh, our algebras Although, technically speaking, the multiplication table has huge size, it's uniquely specified by a very small subset of its multiplication table. And this is a kind of generic notion that uh, you have some kind of chains, but actually you have just a small number of important ones and they uniquely specify everything. So, for example, if it was not scattered countable ones, but this was just finite ones, star, then it would be uniquely, multi, uh, dif, uh, uniquely specified but just by binary concatenation, and that's why people talk about monoids as having a binary operation. And then as we go to richer structures, we will need to add more generating sort of important operations, and sometimes maybe this is not going to be possible. So let's prove this theorem, and this theorem is actually a direct corollary of the Hausdorff theorem plus the Ramsey theorem. Uh, why? So we will show that for every chain, its image belongs to the subset in the theorem, namely the smallest set generated by this and that, okay? And we prove this by induction on the Hausdorff decomposition of the chain because we have a positive characterization. 
So what does the so we begin with chains of length one. So clearly that's in the set, yes. And now, what are the uh, possible things? Well, the, the main induction step in the house of decomposition is you decompose a chain as uh, a concatenation of W1, W2, W3, and W4, and so on forever. So suppose that our chain is concatenated as W1, W2, W3, and so on. This is an omega sequence. There's also the case of reverse omega sequence, but it's the same. There's also the case of binary concatenation, but it's even this is, uh, this is uh, completely immediate. And these are simpler chains. So I know that if I apply the homomorphism to them, I am in this special set. And I want to say that the, if I apply the homomorphism here, I am in this special set. And now I use the Ramsey theorem. So I just remind you of what the Ramsey theorem and which particular Ramsey theorem uh, we're talking about. So the Ramsey theorem says that if you color pairs of natural numbers, growing pairs of natural numbers, by a finite set of colors, then you will find uh, some color and some infinite set of natural numbers such that every, if you take pairs from that set, it will always be that color. It's often stated as saying that you have an undirected, gra undirected clique with edges colored by C. And undirected means that uh, uh, you, you, each pair ij is counted only once, so by convention you can assume it, it, it's a growing pair. And uh, it's, it, you, don't, you don't talk about the diagonal, so it's, it's growing pairs, which is important because, for example, if you took the natural numbers and you took the equality relation, so there's two possible values. So if you take an, uh, a, a, a pair, then it's equal or not equal, and it's an un undirected thing, and then you cannot get that, that you cannot apply the Ramsey theorem here. So it's important that you uh, have strictly growing pairs, and then it says that you will get a monochromatic set. And the proof is very simple. It's a, it's a straightforward extension of the pigeonhole principle, iterated infinitely many times, but there's nothing really. Yes, so these are one of those things that are like, uh, the intuitive simplicity is not the same as the, the this intuitive uh, complexity is not the same as the formalized complexity. No, no, it's, 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 it's my mistake. W what joke could that be? Well, there, there's, um, there's a famous uh, British chef, Gordon Ramsay, right? I mean, that's the only joke I can think of. And the, the footballer? What, what's his, uh, his, his, his... I don't know anything about football. There's a footballer so. Ramsay as well. Is there? Yeah. Oh. That, that I don't know. Okay, so, yeah, but there is, foot, there is a footballer of Barbie. Yeah, yeah, but that's with a Y. Leicester, with a, with a Y, Leicester, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, okay. Uh, another example. This is something that 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 is that mentioned uh, by Joel that you uh, gave this definition, which used I think uh, quantifier alternation six as uh, that my, my own favorite example. I think it is quantifier alternation five, so it's not as good, but it's an even simpler thing. Is a pumping lemma. I mean, it's like a ridiculously complicated. Uh, a definition saying nothing <laughs> uh, because your definition said something <laughs> while the pumping lemma <laughs> it, it's sorry oh it was Stefan's sorry it was Stefan's yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah so here you have something like where the logical complexity does is is, is not matching the, you know, the underlying complexity uh, who knows, maybe Stefan's result and, my, and the lamp pumping lemma have the same complexity because at the end, the formulas are not really quantifier free in the pumping lemma because in the pumping lemma, at the end, you have the formula belongs to L, is accepted by the automaton. So, you, know, you have to unfold that as well. And who knows, maybe you can. <laughs> uh, so, okay. So that's the Ramsey theorem, and we just apply it here. So we have this chain here, and we, uh, the, the, we view. The, 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 the numbers that are going to be colored are just the gaps in between the chains. And we color each pair. Oh, sorry, my number is wrong. This should be three. Uh, this should be three here. You color the pair three, six by the value under the homomorphism of this infix between three and six. Okay? So you cover each, inf you color each infix here by its value under the homomorphism. And now the Ramsey theorem tells you uh, that there is some color 
out of the finite set of possible colors, because so you can apply it, such that if you, uh, if you just restrict to some subset of cuts, like maybe two, three, and six, it's always going to be this value in between. And uh, th there's a, you, from this, you, ac you can actually draw some additional information, if you wished, because the Ramsey theorem that not only 2, 3 is going to be the same as 3, 6, but it's also going to be the same as 2, 6. So from that, you can also draw the conclusion that M is going to be idempotent, but it's not necessary in this argument. Uh, and now we're done, because we know that the infinite suffix here is just M, 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 M. We're implicitly using associativity here. Uh, and therefore, the value of the whole word is going to be M omega times some finite prefix, which is, uh, which is okay. This application of the Ramsey theorem, it originally appeared, as far as I know, in this, this Buhi proof uh, uh, for the decidability of MSO uh, over the natural num numbers. And who knows, maybe it appeared somewhere else implicitly, but uh, I, uh, this, this is too, too, too busy. After it was discovered again by other people who did not know about Bushing, in, in actually in program analysis, um, but, uh, you know, in this context, I think Bush was the first one to... Although Lorenzo raised a nat natural question, because the title of Ramsey's paper is uh, uh, a theorem of formal logic. No, it is. Ramsey, Ramsey, Ramsey's paper was a paper in logic, but uh, it was a different kind of logic. He was looking essentially at, uh, at the first order logic who is, let's say, essential followed by universal. Mm -hmm. And you want to prove that if there are there, if there is a arbitrary large finite model, uh -huh. then there has to be an infinite an infinite model. Okay, so that it, it's, it's it's a different spirit. Then. It's a different spirit. So it's an application to logic, but it's very different application. So so now I I'm I'm wondering if maybe uh, so based on on uh, some stuff that I found somewhere that maybe this type of spirit of using logic over infinite uh, chains. Uh, it, it, the, Rams, the use of the Ramsey theorem might have been done before by Adam Feucht and Mostowski, but I want to, uh, I don't want to. This is what I read somewhere, but I want to see how, how similar it is. But certainly I know this from, I mean, not directly, but indirectly from Vichy. Okay, yes? How do you know that your, you know, the, the set given to you by Ramsey will be a suffix? Because since you could have an omega sitting in there, you could have an infinite set. So uh, if I look at this infix here, I don't know what color is it, violet or, or something, there could be cuts here. It could do, 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 and you know, have a limit, and then uh, that's, that's OK. It, the, the picture could be misleading. It's not suggesting that this is, uh, 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 these are all finite words. Is that answering your question? Fractalization of a suffix. So you're, are you saying from some point in your word on, you have this property that... Yes, because it's an infinite set. So here I use countability. Because if I look at this infinite set, 2, 3, 6, it's an infinite set, so it goes arbitrarily far, and therefore it covers the entire chain. Why did it have to go arbitrarily far, since you could have an omega order type sitting inside and then stuff further beyond? But my assumption was that this W is an infinite concatenation of such... Uh, of W1, W2, W3, and so on. So it has... As long as you identify, if, as you, if you view W7 as a single letter, it's really an omega word. So that's it. It's just a direct application of the Hauser combination of the Hauser theorem and the, and the Ramsey theorem. Okay. So this is where you're using the countability, I guess, because the, well, through the Hausdorff characterization. Yes. So, but countability, you could uh, then have non-countable ones, but then you would need uh, to use, and uh, so, uh, there would, we would have problems eventually, because uh, it's undecidable, or I mean, uh, or at least. But then the omega would have to be replaced by, uh, and uh, the Ramsey theorem for ordinals different than omega, there's some subtle points there. Uh, I think it's Erdos uh, Rado. Uh, uh, what happens if you want to uh, do the Ramsey theorem for, you know, mm, not in, uh, countable the infinite clique, but like some, you know, uncountable clique? 
and uh, I don't remember, but it, 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 there are some subtleties there. So you, you have to deal with that, and I, I, I don't know exactly what to do. So just, just a comment that uh, Ramsey, uh, the use of Ramsey complementation was, was really go back to the paper appeared in 1962. And in the last uh, 20 years, other mathematical principles have been discovered to give different complementation construction. So by now we have at least three distinct mathematical analyses. So what are the other two? One is based on rank, one is based on profile. So by now we have, yeah. and not to mention there is, of course, determinization, which also do complementation. But determination is right now still a mess. But the two other ones are both really underlying mathematical structure with a lot of elegance. And it would be interesting at some point to look at them and say, do they have any, can we use, do they have anything to say about the algebraic approach? Again, they have been used only in a narrow context of, of complementation of Bouge automata, but they may have some algebraic. So, so, so there is, a, a, for example, uh, you can prove uh, the McNaughton theorem about determinization using algebra. Uh, in, a, in my opinion, interesting and non-trivial way. Uh, by using the structural theory of monoids. So, and uh, this, 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 this proof that uses monoids, I don't know, I don't see it being the same. I think it's completely different than uh, the LAR construction or, uh, uh, or, or the other construction that can be used for, for, for determinization. So I think, yeah, there's, there's, there's some stuff going on there. So that's, uh, we have this theorem here, which says that you only need to know these three things. And that's the end of the proof, because if we want to uh, decide uh, if a sentence phi is true in some chain, we look at the quantifier rank of the sentence, and then we consider the homomorphism which assigns to a sentence its k-type. And now we know by this theorem that's hidden here that the set of the image of this function can be obtained by the k types of individual letters closed under binary concatenation and omega power and reverse omega power. And assuming that you can represent k types in a finite way, which you can, and assuming that given two k types you can compute their binary concatenation and their omega power, which you can, and the reverse omega power, which you can, then that gives you an algorithm because you just begin with the types of the individual letters, close it under these operations, keep on adding until it stabilizes, then you know all of the k types that can appear for some chain, and then you scan through that finite list and check which one is consistent with psi, I and mean, if you find one that's consistent with psi, you're done, otherwise you say it's unsatisfying. And uh, the point of this, uh, there's many nice things I think about this approach, and one of them is that it's very transparent, I mean there's no, there's, you can, local, there's a lot of parts of this argument are completely generic. And uh, therefore you can ask, how far can you go? And I'll give you one other illustration of this type of argu uh, argument. And then maybe if we have some time, I can discuss about what is the scope of this technique. How would this, uh, let's even imagine, this is just, we're just doing it over the uh, final wall, the sigma stuff. Where, how, where would it become uh, non-elementary in the number of uh, basic types? In the size of this monoid, yes. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, so, uh, this monoid, how do you represent k types? Well, uh, a k type is a set of k minus one types. So that's what happens. Yes? This is what you cannot do, for example, Professor. No, 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 no. It's, I'm not doing that. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a subtle point, uh, but what I have here is maybe let me. It's a bit subtle. So it's uh, I have, let's call it K pre-types. Whenever you have pre in the name of your notion, you can see a lazy mind at work, yes? Uh, or, uh, so uh, a K pre-type is a syntactic object. It's, it's essentially a set of formulas, okay? A, a set of MSO formulas. And you don't know if the set of formulas is consistent, and 
but it, it, it's, it's maximal. So for every MSO sentence, it contains it or the next. But you don't know if it's consistent. That's a K3 type. Now, because many things are undecidable, you don't know, given a K3 type, if it's, if, it's, if it's true in some arbitrary structure, if it's true in some structure of this type. You don't know this. But at least you can represent it. Just write it down. Okay? That's our bigger monoid. Okay? And now, so these are the elements that we're manipulating. Now, if you, con if you take a single letter, A, it has a certain K pre-type. You look at all sentences that it satisfies. This you can compute. And then you start with K pre-types of single letters. And then out of those K pre-types that you have computed, uh, you close it under the three operations. Now one has to explain how on K pre times you K pre types you can compute uh, binary concatenation and uh, the omega power. This 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 takes some effort, but it, it can be done. So the objects you're manipulating are K pre types without a priori knowledge if they're uh, if they can be decided. And you start with ones which can be certainly satisfied, and you close it under operations which deserve that. So in some sense, you are because you're focusing on that only finitely many sentences here because you're yes. focusing on, on bounded drug. So in some sense, what you're saying is start with the with a very simple uh, sentences that you know are going to be consistent because they're not crossing the wall. Or you can think of sentences. Even sentences, a set of sentences. And essentially build a set of all satisfiable uh, sentences inductively. Exactly, by closing them under... You can think of the omega power as, a proper, as, a, as an operation on, sen on sentences. Not on all sentences, but on... Now, it, uh, it's not completely clear how to apply, how to define this omega power, and uh, one has to think about it, okay? But what's interesting Even about binary it, product is but not what's clear. interesting is you're almost saying that we can, we have an inductive characterization of satisfiability. Yes, that's what I'm saying, yes. And it's interesting because I usually use satisfiability to give as an example to students as a logical property that is not inductive. At least when I think about propositional logic, typically I used to do proof by, by, by induction, but when you come to characterizing satisfiable formulas, and I wonder if there is an inductive algorithm to compute all just cool and satisfiable formulas. There must be some construction like that. So uh, what, this, so yes, so there's some, some, some something going on here, which is, I think, very interesting. So one corollary of this lemma that we had here oh, is, is uh, let's come back to this special Ramsey argument. One corollary is, but if you want to uh, have a value in the image of this homomorphism H, then you don't need to use very complicated chains. You can on, it's sufficient to consider certain chains, let's call them regular, which are the set of regular chains is the set of single node chains, closed under concatenation, and closed under omega power. Not all chains are like this because there's countably many regular chains. And what this theorem is telling you is that uh, this is enough. So it has many different consequences, the, 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 this result. And now if you're asking for satisfiability over regular chains, then this is an inductive thing because you know it's every regular chain is represented by a finite term and then you can just go by induction on, on, on this term. So this type of result, once you've proved it, it has many different corollaries. In particular, it says that you can limit the set of interesting structures to certain ones which are finitely presentable. And then it acquires an inductive character. Okay, so can I have a question? Why is that monoid finite? Maybe a silly question. This monoid? So this is because it's a, a subset of all K pre-types. So, so uh, it, no, it just shows that you're a mathematician. <laughs> uh, so, no, no, uh, insults aside, I tell you what's going on. So there's a, uh, this EF game there's a, a basic theorem which says that uh, duplicator winning is the same thing as satisfying the same MSO sentence. Of a certain rank. Of, of, this, of, 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 of the certain rank. Now, it is not clear at all, and this is why you reasonably ask the question, why this equivalence relation should have finite many equivalence class. However, if you view it from the syntactic point of view, satisfying the same MSO sentences of a given quantifier rank, and then it is almost immediately clear that there's finitely many uh, MSO sentences of a given rank, and therefore there's finitely many subsets. 
Now it's almost immediately clear because technically speaking, uh, if you take a sentence phi and you take phi and phi and phi and phi, it, it preserves the quantifier rank, and, but this, it can be very long. So that's why you need to normalize them somehow. It, so this is a little bit of syntactic manipulation that, 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 that is required. Yes. But that requires, that, that, that takes, that, that, that takes like seven sentences to explain, I'd say. No? Okay, so th this is, uh, this, uh, this ends the part about scattered countable orders. And now let's go to the more general setting of arbitrary countable orders, not necessarily scattered. So the classic example, of course, is the rationals. This is an ordering that we have not covered so far. And as we will see, it's the only example in a certain sense that will be made precise in a moment. So maybe, uh, so I write, I had the diamond previously, now I use circle. The intention is to be, uh, the intention is first of all that this is historically accurate, but also the other intention is that uh, you see it's just various types of symbol and you would just want to, it, it, it's intended to make you want uh, a general <laughs> uh, definition, okay? So I write sigma circle for all countable total orders labeled by sigma without any scattered assumption. For such orders, there is no nice Hausdorff theorem. I mean, there is a, there is a Hausdorff theorem actually by Hausdorff, but it's, uh, uh, it, it's not what we're going to use. Uh, and let's give one example of such a chain, and actually, essentially, as you see, the only example. Uh, it's called shuffle. So suppose I have two, well, one example is the rational numbers, but this is a slight generalization of the rational numbers because we're allowed to have a labeling, yes? So suppose our alphabet contains two different letters, red and blue. So shuffle of red and blue is the rational numbers labeled with red and blue so that red is dense and blue is dense. Okay, so let's draw a picture. How, how do you construct it? Well, you first put red and blue. Then in each, there's, there's three zones, before, in the middle, and after. And in each zone, you put red and blue. Now there's more zones, I don't know, nine or ten. And then in each zone, you put red and blue. And you continue so on, so forever. Uh, I think this is as far as I got, but you can... And now if you think about the limit of this process, every two things are going to be separated by red and blue. Yes, because you take two things, they appear at some stage, and later on you will insert red and blue in between. So the red will be dense and the blue will be dense. Now you could think maybe there's many different ways of doing this. Why did I write shuffle? I mean, maybe there's a set of chains. But actually, no, it's only one chain. So you can show that if a chain labeled by red and blue is countable, and both red and blue are dense, then you, this can, up to isomorphism, this can only be done in one way. And it's not so difficult, so maybe I can draw the picture here. It's a classical proof that the rational numbers are the only dense countable order. Okay? You, you almost prove it. Exactly. Yeah, but let's do the same picture again. It always helps to do the exact same thing twice. Uh, as Einstein famously non-remarked. Uh, so you have two candidates for the shuffle. And you know, you take some blue position here. Well, there's a blue position somewhere. So I may assume them to be there. Now I take some red position here. Uh, I take some position here. Now some random position here. And it has some color, say, say red. So there is some red position here because it's dense. So I say, now I, I, I do, uh, I, uh, each time I play on the opposite side. Now I ask here, I take some new position here that hasn't been covered yet. It has some color, maybe it's blue. So there has to be a blue position here. And then if you alternate between, uh, it's, it's called, I think, the zigzag, uh, the, the back and forth method, you can construct an isomorph. So there's only one way to do it. And that is why you can speak of the shuffle of red and blue. Okay? In particular, if you had just shuffle of blue only, that would be the rational numbers. And uh, so this is a unique up to isomorphism. And since we're treating chains up to isomorphism, it's just one, one, one element. You could do this over uh, uh, great bigger sets of colors. And you know, for example, you, it's easy to observe that 
if you take the sh shuffle of red, uh, of blue, red, and gray, then it's the same as the shuffle of red, blue, red, and gray, because using red twice doesn't affect anything, yeah? because red is, is, is dense. So essentially, it's an operation, if you think about it, which inputs a set of colors, and repetitions and ordering are not important, and it produces such a okay? that's, that's an operation, shuffle. Uh, and uh, this is, so that was an important example of a countable chain. Okay, and now we're trying, going to try to do the, the, the entire proof that we did previously uh, in the slightly more general setting of countable chains, okay? So let's begin by defining algebras. So what's a circle monoid? Now it's a, the, our new notion of, 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 of infinite chains. Well, it's a, it's a set together with a multiplication operation. It's a generalized multiplication operation. Now it inputs a countable chain, not necessarily scattered, and it squashes it down, yeah? And it's supposed to be associative in the same sense that we said previously. So if you decompose a countable chain, I think, I didn't even write the diagram. If you decom decompose a chain into a chain of chains and then you multiply inside and then you multiply outside, it doesn't, that doesn't affect anything. You have the notion of homomorphisms. So these are things which don't, again, uh, if you apply the homomorphism and then multiply, or you first multiply, apply the homomorphism, nothing happens. And the notion of a recognizable language is a language which is recognized by homomorphism, a finite algebra. Completely transparent definition. Okay? And uh, again, it's very easy to see that for every quantifier rank k, the k-type function is compositional. Because actually, it's compositional for arbitrary chains, not necessarily countable. So in particular, for countable ones. A corollary of that is that MSO is going to be uh, recognizable. MSO implies recognize. But this still leaves open the problem of, 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 uh, of algorithms, of deciding satisfiability. And for this, we need some combinatorical insights, as we did previously using the Ramsey theorem. So here's going to be a little bit more fancy, and I think very nice, and we'll see that in a moment. But so far, we know that MSO definable implies recognizable. And this would be true for a for any kinds of linear orderings and, and the, the, with the same proof, in particular. Here. Uh, an, imp an important remark is that the converse is also true. Um, I, I'd like to maybe stop for a moment and discuss this. So, if you use the automata method and uh, uh, you show that, say, for example, over omega words, non-deterministic Buchi automata are the same thing as uh, MSO, then there's one interesting implication, which is from MSO to automata. On the other hand, if you want to go from automata to MSO, you just directly formalize the acceptance. So this easy direction becomes the hard direction here. Why? Because if you are, have an omega word, then there's a very natural canonical parse tree. However, now a, a homomorphism algebra it's not something which inputs a position, but which inputs an infix, sort of. And it's not so clear how to get a canonical parse tree there. Because MSO is not good for quantifying over infixes. Because an infix is a pair of positions. Uh, so it's not at all clear how to use MSO to express uh, the value of an algebra. Because, so for finite words, you could do it because, you know, there's some canonical way of parsing a, a finite word with respect to a, a monoid. But for infinite words, this is not clear. So this is a non-trivial theorem, but it is true. And actually, it turns out that uh, the, the, the so-called easy direction, so recognized by a finite device implies definable in MSO, this is the one that becomes harder in many different settings. Uh, so this is one example, but there, 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 there are other examples. And, excuse me, and to prove this, do they use Simon's theorem? Of course. Of course. To get some canonicity of parts, right? Yes. So we have these algebraic structures. There was nothing to do here, just use the standard definition. But now we want to ma algorithmically maintain them. So if we remember for the scattered linear orderings, we discovered that it's not really, there's only three important operations that you need to use, and that's it. And we will see that this is the same here. And this uh, is uh, the following result. So we want to decide uh, MSO on the countable chains, not necessarily scattered. And to do that, we will use the algebraic method. And we will use the following result. 
Uh, maybe I, I, I forget about... Uh, ah, okay, maybe I, I should mention some stuff. Uh, sorry, before I show you how to do this, maybe some, uh, some remarks. So, this is our goal to decide if uh, 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 satisfiability over all scattered, uh, over all countable chains. This subsumes the previous result, because if you want to know about scattered, you can MSO axiomatize this, so this is, uh, this is not such a big deal. Uh, but uh, one, uh, two comments about this. Number one, as opposed to scattered words, for arbitrary countable words, there's one most difficult one, namely the rational numbers. Because every countable linear order embeds into the rational numbers. Using this, a one-sided version of this. Okay? Therefore, an equivalent problem would be this. You are given an MSO formula, which only uses the order, and you just want to decide if it's true in the rational numbers. I mean, it's uh, directions both ways are not difficult to see. So, for example, if you want to solve the top problem, uh, you want to reduce the top problem to the bottom problem, well, your formula just guesses a subset of this, which is intended to be the actual uh, parts used in, in this chain here, and then it guesses the label. And conversely, uh, you can axiomatize the rational numbers. It's just, it's dense. So that's an, and infinite. Okay? So this is the same problem. So that's why some people present this, could present this result as, as just deciding the MSO theory of the rational numbers. A second, uh, this is not true for scattered, uh, scattered linear, uh, scattered countable words. There is no one most difficult. And therefore, there, you cannot phrase it. This way. A second remark I want to make is that this result, and therefore this one as well, it follows from the Rabin theorem. The Rabin theorem says that the MSO theory of the infinite tree is decidable, and you can view the infinite tree as, as, as the rational numbers as follows. This is zero. This is the middle number, middle negative number. This is the middle positive number, and you know, so on. And then, so you can, uh, uh, so uh, what is formally going on, you MSO interpret the rational numbers in the complete binary tree. And because the complete binary tree has decidable MSO theory, then also the rational numbers. And actually, uh, uh, this does not exhaust the full complexity of, of Rabin's theorem. Okay, so it's, uh, Rabin's theorem is a, is a proper generalization. I mean, at least intuitively. I think you should ask uh, Pierre or Michal who are thinking about uh, formalizing uh, this statement that I, I just said, that Rabin's theorem is stronger than this. I, I, did you prove this? Is it? No. You, you, is, it is it? So you... It seems likely that it's provably Rabin's theorem is, is stronger, yes? But ongoing work. And of course, you have to say what does it mean to be stronger and so on. But, that's okay. but I don't want to use the Rabin's theorem. I want to use the algebraic methodology. And I think maybe now would be a good time for a break after. Jo jo so just the, um, th there's also, um, I know very little about this, but. Um, uh, so you can go beyond the binary tree, right? So, so there's the a work that um, uh, Colin Sterling and Lu Kong, you know, they find these uh, graphs of these pushdown systems, and then they show that MSO on these things is decidable. Mm -hmm. And these are sort of proper uh, generalizations, I mean, the, the, uh, of Rabin, aren't they? Yes, so, well, okay, so the question is, what's a proper generalization? Uh, of course, they are new results which imply uh, uh, Rabin and don't follow directly from it in some intuitive sense. But if you would want to make a mathematical statement about that, then you have to look at the proof theoretic, and this is what uh, s uh, pe people are doing, in particular Michal and Pierre. Uh, uh, it's called reverse mathematics. And then uh, 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 you want to identify things. So it's what's, uh, what I understand it is, is, is likely that Buhi's theorem, now this is known already, that Buhi's theorem is simpler than Rabin's theorem. But this theorem about the rational numbers, it's like in the middle, but it's likely to be, is it likely to be just in the middle or to be the same as Buhi? It's above Buhi, but maybe lower. So people classify these things. And I don't know about, uh, uh, about the extensions of Rabin's theorem, but my intuition would be that maybe they don't add anything in the reverse mathematical sense because I think that the set theoretical principles 
that are used might be the same. But of course, the combinatorics are different. But in the reverse mathematics, you only care about, uh, you don't care so much about the, 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 the finite combinatorics, which seem to be, but this, I'm just, you know, making it up. Yeah, but you have to check what goes on in the induction step, yes? But it's, it looks likely that it's a benign thing from reverse mathematics. Okay, so what, uh, we'll take maybe a short break now. Uh, after the break, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, prove this theorem using the algebraic method. This, I hope, will probably won't take too much time. And then we will go to abstract nonsense. Here, this, I want to underline once again, this is all countable words, scattered or not. So it contains scattered, but adds more. Okay, so this, this sigma circle means all countable words, and by countable word I mean a countable uh, total order labeled by by God. Okay. So, you have people who are working on the reverse mathematics of some of this stuff. So I have always wondered about Bushy theorem. So Bushy theorem uses Ramsey, and the other proof everybody uses Kenning, at least Kenning's lens. Okay, and the question is there is a basic result which is the complement of Omega regular is omega regular, right? I and mean, you can look at it this way. Is it true in Z? Is this theorem true in ZF? Can I pass the microphone to me? Did you hear the question? Uh, I didn't hear the last. Thing. So you can look at Bushy theorem that says the complement of omega regular is omega regular. The pr all the proof uses some version of Kenny's lemma. Hmm? Or Ramsey, right? Well, Ramsey, Ramsey uses Kenning's lemma. I mean, there's no, I, I think Ramsey requires Kenning's lemma. But Ramsey can use, I think Ramsey is equivalent in proof theoretic uh, terms to reverse mathematics. People have studied the relationship between this. So the weakest, the weakest is weak Kenning's lemma. I just sit at the bottom of all these principles. No, no, you can go below that. Yeah, so the question, my question is, what is the reverse mathematics of that theorem of Bushy, not the construction. Yeah, so this is the a complement of omega regular is omega regular. If you go to ZF, for example, Mm -hmm. Is it still true? Um, so this is exactly what uh, Henrik Mihalewski, Leszek, Kowiejczyk, and Pierre and me studied. And it seems that, um, for instance, the... Um, the Ramsey you use is not the full Ramsey, but it's Ramsey for so-called additive colorings, which have this m monoidal structure on it. Uh, and then it is w below a weak Kinnick's lemma, and it is equivalent to sigma zero to induction. It's orthogonal to, yes, it's orthogonal to... Mm -hmm. I've asked the same questions, people do constructive mathematics, mm -hmm. to say, I end up with a very, with algorithmic construction, right? But the proof goes through very non-constructive things. If you stick to constructive mathematics, where you cannot do any of this stuff, is it still true? Is there a constructive argument? Yeah, so in a sense, this uh, sigma zero to induction is constructive. For instance, it holds in the decidable sets. So, so Behe's theorem can be proved. In, in, in this fragment. But Rabin's theorem not so much. But Rabin's theorem definitely not. It is another paper by, by uh, Henrik and Leszek, and it requires very non-constructive principles. Yeah, so those are the I ideal things for those type of reverse mathematics because you're clearly using some infinite thing. Okay, so the problem that we're studying, just to be perfectly clear, this denotes all countable words. It... Uh, so, Damian, I think you're asking, do I remove some words? Uh, then it's undecidable because, uh, for example, the real numbers. But you can axiomatize the, the, the you can axiomatize the counter set, for example, which is undecidable already. Uh, so, no, if you remove countability, so this is close to the limit. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> And uh, mm, so this is the problem we want to decide, and we want to use algebraic methods, we want to use the monoids. And if you remember, uh, in the scattered case, we use this Hausdorff theorem to find a small number of generating operations. And we will use a similar thing here, we also have a small number of generating operations. So what we're going to do, this is, uh, uh, and here it is. So the main lemma is the following. Let's have a, a, a homomorphism from arbitrary countable word to some finite set, uh, finite structure, and then 
the image is the least subset which contains chains of length at most one. It's closed under binary concatenation, omega concatenation, reverse omega concatenation, and the shuffle operation. So you only need to add shuffle. Okay? So shuffle, it's, uh, if you think about the signature, concatenation is a binary operation. Omega power is a unary operation. Shuffle is, doesn't even fit. It inputs a set. So, or you could view as uh, unary shuffle, binary shuffle, ternary shuffle, and so on. Uh, but uh, so the shuffle operation, it takes an unbounded number of arguments and shuffles them. And then so, but it, it, since the order and multiplicity is irrelevant, you should think of the shuffle operation as having the signature a subset of M to M. And of course, if you're working in a fixed monoid M, then there's finitely many ways you can do this, so it's, it's okay. So this is the theorem that we're going to prove. And this is due to uh, Shellach. Okay, the, this whole theorem is due to Shellach. And therefore, in particular, if you extract the scattered case, you're not allowed to use shuffle, so you recover the previous theorem. Uh, so this was proved in Shellach's paper on the monadic theory of order. No. Ah. <laughs> uh, Colcombe, uh, Carton Colcombe and, and Gabriele. Oh, there's lots of margins, you know. <laughs> uh, I don't think so. I mean, because the combinatorics, uh, so what, what, what I should cite to man, I, I think I did, is, is the uh, converse implication. Uh, so it's true that there's a, I mean, it's true that they, you, they called it a monoid. So Shellach did, didn't prove this for arbitrary algebraic structures, but he just proved it for the specific algebraic monoid of K types. It's the same proof and the same techniques. So that's why I would, uh, I think here it's, 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 it's fair just to say that it's Shellach. It's true that calling it an algebraic structure with a multiplication operation, this is due to, 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 to Colcombe, Carton, and, and Pupis. But I, I, I would say that, that what's going on here is, is, is the Shellach paper. Okay, so we want to uh, show that these operations are the only thing you need. Once you have that, you recover decidability using the same type of meta-algorithm. That you start off with the types of individual letters, and then you inductively close it under, under these operations. Again, if you think about it harder, it's not so completely clear, because given a set of MSO sentences, so a K-type, uh, maybe, how do you compute its shuffle? It's not at all clear, but I won't tell you. No, actually, you need to use the same techniques as you use to prove this in a provable way. So there's like a meta thing uh, that uh, if you have this type of theorem, then the same proof that gives you this will also give you computability of these, these, these operations. We can discuss this maybe later. So it's using the same ideas. So, for example, if you have an MSO, MSO K type, how do you compute its omega power? Implicitly, you're going to use the Ramsey theorem. And uh, so here also, you're, it's, it's, so it's, it's a non-trivial non part, but the proof for that non-trivial part, which I'm sk skipping, is exactly the same as, as, as for this result. And I, so that's, I, I focus on this result. So the computability part requires a, uh, a certain insight as well, but it's the same insight. Yes? And there is not analogous or Hasdorff characterization for quantum orders using some kind of shuffle. So there is, uh, yes, so there, Hausdorff's theorem, uh, what, what I think uh, is actually Hausdorff's theorem, as opposed to what I said, is uh, that every order, every total order, countable or not, can be decomposed as a dense order, and inside the dense parts, you have scattered things. So like one dense layer, and then inside, arbitrary, sorry? But it's not a shuffle, it's a dense order of, you know, the, the, the way in which these, these scattered things is used is completely irregular. And uh, 
And that I think is not so helpful here. But maybe, yeah. Okay, so let's prove this theorem. Uh, and uh, I will give you the whole proof. Uh, so uh, we have this homomorphism from chains, countable chains to a set, or oh, should be called M, sorry. Should be called M. And I want to prove that the image is generated by these operations. Okay? Let me define, co I call a chain well-behaved if not only its image is in the set, but this is recursively true in the sense that for all of its infixes, this is also true. Okay? So a chain is called well-behaved if the value of the chain under the homomorphism satisfies this theorem, and not only the value of the entire chain satisfies this theorem, but the value of every infix of it. And the infix of a chain, I hope, is the obvious no notion, okay? It doesn't need to be a closed, closed infix, yes? You can have like, a, a, a f mm, for example, if you take uh, the rational numbers, then the rational numbers, the, the, u the open, uh, open unit interval in the rational numbers is an infix, and it doesn't have a least or greatest position. So that, by infix, I just mean restricting the chain to some interval, okay? Which does not need to be open or uh, closed or anything. And there's four types. So I, I, I will call a, a, a chain well-behaved if it satisfies the conclusion of this theorem and every infix satisfies it heredit hereditarily. So our goal is to show that every chain is well behaved. Yes. And uh, but this hereditary thing is going to be useful. So uh, this is our goal. All chains are well behaved. And the first lemma is going to be that well behaved chains are closed under binary concatenation, omega concatenation, and reverse omega concatenation. Maybe shuffle. I mean indeed shuffle, but this is, uh, we're not going to prove that, we're not going to need that, okay? And this is quite simple. So let's do binary concatenation. So suppose I have two well-behaved chains. So remember, well-behaved chain means that if I uh, evaluate the homomorphism on every infix of it, it belongs to the set in the theorem. So let's try to evaluate the homomorphism on some infix. Well, if the infix is entirely contained in the red part, we use the fact that the red part is well behaved because it's an infix of the red part. If it's here, then okay. And otherwise, it has like a f begins with a red part and a blue part. So the first half will belong to the appropriate set. The second part will belong to the appropriate set, but the appropriate set closed on the binary concatenation, so it's okay. So this is straightforward. Uh, suppose now that I have a omega concatenation. So I have uh, a well-behaved chain, another well-behaved chain, another well-behaved chain, and I just continue like this forever. I want to show that it's well-behaved, okay? So I look at some infix. Maybe that infix is finite, so maybe it's contained like in this part. Then I use the binary part, binary case that I have already proved. Otherwise, my infix is a suffix, okay? So I take some suffix of it, and let's just assume without loss of, yeah, it's of loss of generality that this is actually the whole chain. Yeah? That, that, that's really the general case. Because if it's some proper suffix, then if I, uh, I just restrict it to this part, then this is going to be well behaved and I concatenate it binary. So essentially, I want to show, all I need, really need to show is that the entire chain has its value uh, in the set. And here I just use the Ramsey argument exactly as I did before. Okay, so I apply the Ramsey theorem, bam, bam, bam. Here I get m omega. Here I get something that might be decomposed. Okay, so well-behaved chains are closed under these operations. This is where we're using this Ramsey argument. So that's the first step. Uh, now uh, I am going toward my goal. And I want to show that every chain is well-behaved. So let's take some chain and eventually we will prove that it's well-behaved. Okay? But now it's, uh, and consider the following relation on positions of the chain. I say that two positions in this chain are equivalent if the interval which connects them is well behaved. Okay? So maybe my chain is something like this. I don't know if the whole chain is well behaved, but I say that X and Y 
are kind of close if this interval, the infix which, the, which contains them is well behaved. Okay? This is an equivalent relation. Why? Uh, I, I, I'll, let's see if it's in the slides. Well, no, it's not. <laughs> so why? Well, it, we need to show that it's transitive. So suppose that these two guys are equivalent and also Y and Z is equivalent. But that means that this is well-behaved and we know that well-behaved chains are closed under concatenation. Okay? So it's an equivalent relation. Uh, and what I will show now, uh, well, uh, I don't think I need to show this. Yeah, I, I do need to show this, that every equivalence class of this relation is well-behaved. It's not completely obvious because an equivalence class is a kind of limit object. But here I will use the, Ramsey, the, the, the first lemma. So uh, let's take such an equivalence class. This is this equivalence class. And because uh, our, uh, our ordering is countable, this equivalence class can be viewed as a limit of an in increasing uh, chain of well-behaved infixes. Why? Because him and him are equivalent. So there's a well-behaved chain which connects them. Then him and him are equivalent, so there's a well-behaved chain that connects them. I can make these chains go t towards both ends. So our equivalence class is a limit of an increasing sequence of well-behaved infixes. Okay? It looks something like this. This is the increasing sequence. And now, if I look at these deltas, the things that are added in each step, they are infixes of well-behaved chains. Yes? So they're well behaved. This is where I use the hereditary infix thing. So this is an omega reverse omega concatenation of well behaved chains. This is a forward omega concatenation of, uh, of, of well behaved chains. So the entire thing is well behaved. Okay? So this gives me this lemma that the equivalence classes of this relation are well behaved. And now it's the end game. Okay? We're, we're, we're at the, uh, essentially at the end. So. Uh, we have our uh, original chain here. We want to show that it is well behaved. Yes? Let's. Maybe I think it's easiest to show a picture here. This is our chain W. And we have these equivalence classes of the relation. There's many of these. Each part here is well behaved. Yes? Uh, and I define a new chain. This is a chain of chains, which corresponds to exactly this. So the positions are equivalence classes, and inside I, 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 I have the contents of this equivalence class. Yes? The chain of chains. It corresponds to the factorization of the chain along the equivalence classes. Yes? Uh, so this is the chain U. It's a chain of chain. So the positions are equivalence classes of, the, of this equivalence relation, and each equivalence class is labeled by its corresponding index. Okay. And the main observation is that this picture is wrong. It's going to be dense. So you cannot have two consecutive equivalence classes, and the reason is just because uh, you remember well-behaved chains are closed under concatenation. So you cannot have two consecutive things. So yeah, so it has to be dense. If you had two consecutive, you could join them. And therefore, every two equivalence classes are separated by a third one. Or there's just one element. Yes. If it has size one, then this chain is, is, is all well, the entire original chain was well behaved. Otherwise, it's a dense product of well behaved chains. Not a shuffle, because they're very irregular. But it's a dense product of well-behaved chains. And uh, this, we will see, uh, will lead us to a uh, contradiction. Okay? And uh, the reason is as follows, that uh, we have this chain here. And we have grouped it by maximal, uh, max, essentially these are maximal infixes which are well-behaved. And uh, if it is dense, there's going to be a problem with this maximality, as we will see in a moment. And formally speaking, we will use the following lemma, which says that every dense countable chain labeled by a finite set of colors contains a shuffle as an infix. Somewhere. 
actually in many places, but in at least one place. Why is that true? So imagine that you color the rational numbers with a finite set of colors, red, blue, green, okay? So this is our uh, rati rational numbers colored by ABC, okay? It's, it's co colored in some crazy way. I mean, it's, 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 this was supposed to be the meaning of this color. I, cl I claim that somewhere here you will find a shuffle. And it's actually a very simple observation, why? So I ask the following question. I look at the first color A and I ask, is there some interval where A does not appear at all? Yes or no? So maybe yes. If the answer is yes, that means I can zoom into that interval and it does, A does not appear at all, so my alphabet has decreased. But it, the rational numbers have this fractal structure, so again I have the rational numbers. So now I ask, is there some uh, interval where B does not appear? And maybe yes. So I, uh, so then maybe no. <laughs> that means it appears in every interval, so it's dense. And this will be preserved when zooming in. So and I zoom in again, and I ask, is there some interval where C does not appear? And maybe yes, so I zoom in. So I have zoomed in, so A and C do not appear, but this continues to be dense. So it's a shuffle. Okay. It's a very simple argument. Nothing going on combinatorially here. And uh, if we uh, have this, then we're done. Because uh, we have this chain U something. On some infix, it's a shuffle. And therefore, on that infix, uh, the value should be in our set. And therefore, that infix should be well behaved. But it was, it, was, it was allegedly not because it was split into equivalence classes. Yes? So uh, maybe I draw the picture. I have this, uh, so my, okay, maybe the picture, let's do it again. This is U, so it's, it's split across into equivalence classes in some dense way. My lemma says that somewhere here, it's a shuffle. But that means that this infix itself is well, well, well behaved. Okay? And therefore my equivalence classes should have been bigger. So that's the end of the proof. Okay, so this proves uh, Shadak's theorem, which, uh, the main lemma, and therefore the decidability. What it also proves is the, 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 the same corollaries as we had before. It says that uh, every algebra for countable chains is uniquely determined by these operations. So there's a finite multiplication table, in fact. It also shows that if an MSO formula is true in some countable chain, then it's true in some countable chain which can be generated by these operations. So there's a finite description of, of the witnesses. So there's some nice corollaries of that. Okay. If I were to try to prove, the, let's say, the monadic theory of the, of the rationals, I would probably first try to do it by interpretation. And is, is it known, for example, that this is not possible? Is there a negative result along this line? It, My it, interpretation it, in what? I mean, I mean take for, suppose, for example, you want to just look at the, at the bi-infinite world. Then it's very, just very easy to reduce it to infinite words over twice the alphabet, for example. Okay, you just you increase the alphabet and you fold the bi-infinite and you reduce it. So it, it's become interpretation. Some notion of interpretation, I haven't explored exactly, but it's very easy to reduce bi-infinite or, and you, you kind of could do the same along other things. I, have not, I don't know how much people have explored. How much can you do things just by interpretation? So I'm, I'm not aware of any such proof, and uh, I, I would more intuitively say that it's impossible, but then, of course, you do have to say in what sense, and then I assume that maybe this reverse mathematics sense would be one possible negative answer that you can... So, so we know, for example, the reverse mathematics of Scheller theorem is stronger than, let's say, Rabin theorem? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, uh, uh. The order is this. Büchi, Shelach, Rabin. Because the Shelach theorem in this case, well, it's disappointing that Shelach gets superseded by somebody. Sometimes. No, no. Because <laughs> one way, one, one actually not unreasonable to, die, to write to do is to take the rational and to say, no, I don't see how I interpreted them in, that, in, in a linear order, but in, I can interpret them in a tree. Yes, you can. 
This you can, yeah. The rational numbers interpret in the tree. So that's why the order is uh, Buchi, Shelach, uh, uh, Rabin. And from what I understood uh, from what Pierre was saying, that uh, it seems likely, but it's not proved, that this order is strict in the reverse mathematical sense. And certainly Buchi and Rabin are different, so Shelach cannot be both of them. But it's probably a, a third intermediate step, which is different from both endpoints. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the end of this part. So we have used uh, the mm, algebraic method to derive decidability results over various kinds of words, okay? And now, for 15 minutes, I'd like to go to the uh, third part of my lecture. This is only one I'll be able to do, uh, which is uh, uh, about abstract nonsense. Namely, monads. So let's, what, what does this mean? Okay. Um, and uh, my original goal was to have something about graphs, but this is not going to happen. So monads, we're going to use monads. So to, uh, to explain the, the need, if, if, if at least uh, try to motivate it, let's have a look at the algebras we have seen so far. Okay. Uh, we have seen a monoid, which typically is defined as a binary associative operation, but it can be defined like this. So a monoid is, consists of a universe together with a multiplication operation, which is, makes this diagram. Technically speaking, there is also the, uh, the, 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 the fact that if you multiply a single element, you get a single element again. So this is the thing that Moshe noticed. So it's actually, and it's actually part, well, it's going to end up to be one of the axioms. So, so, so here, what do you view it? You have a, a, a sequences, or, I mean, words of words. Yes. So th this is extremely important. That's why maybe. Uh, Can you go over this diagram and explain? It? I, I, yeah, I, I will. You know what I'll do? I will do uh, this part of the lecture. I'll just do it on the blackboard. So let's look at a uh, monoid over finite words, okay? So formally speaking, let's define it. Maybe I will call it a star monoid to, under, to, to differentiate it from the other monoids that will appear later on. But, but normally it's just called a monoid, yes? Is, and formally speaking, it's a pair of a universe and an operation from M star to M, subject to two axioms. Number one, If we view the one-letter word, this is the typical boring distinction. What's the difference between a one-letter and a one-letter word? So this is, this, 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 this is what's going on right now. If you view the one-letter word, then it, nothing happens to it. And number two, it's going to be a commuting diagram, but maybe it's better to view it this way. So suppose I have a word. There's many different ways to parenthesize it, and I'm only interested, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at depth one parenthesizations. So. This is one parenthesization, okay? What is this parenthesization? It can be viewed as an element M star star, yes? That's why you can have an empty parenthesis once more. And, but there's other ways to parenthesize it, and then there is the flattening operation. Which breaks the parentheses. So you get the same word, you can think of this as a decomposition, yes? 
There's many different decompositions for the same word. And now what you could do is, well, you could apply the monoid operation uh, in, in two different ways. One thing you could do is flatten and multiply. I don't remember how it's in my picture, so I'll do it like this. And then multiply. But another way you could do is you could first multiply inside. Well, this necessarily is going to be M. This is going to be something. And then multiply again. So what we're writing here, the first step is something that I would call multiply star. Which means I, I, I uh, generally speaking, if I have an operation F on alphabets, then I can lift it pointwise. And in this particular case, the, the alphabet is M star. That will give you a unit as well, yeah. I, I, it, it will follow. No, I want M star. So the word unit is, means two different things. I understand you mean monoid unit, yes? So if you want to recover the monoid unit, well, there's the empty chain. And it's, well, the operation gives you some value for it. And you call it one. And from this diagram, you will conclude various properties of one. So actually, this guy is going to be, by notation, going to be one. And then, if you think about the diagram, that's going to imply various things about it. And so what you could do is you could do this. And then apply multiplication again. So that's an alternative definition of a monoid. And what it implies is, is associativity, because it says there's many different ways to decompose a chain, but they all give the same value. OK? This is a super important diagram. And uh, maybe I would, uh, because in the interest of having, OK, let's keep it this way. Um, now, if you remember... Strange about it, the typical uh, commuting diagram kind of tell you, well, there are two things you can do. It doesn't matter which order you do them. So you have some symmetry. Typically, diagrams are kind of symmetric. And here, it doesn't look on the face of it symmetric. Right? Or you have flat, mult star. It's a bit unusual diagram. On, on no, I think it's a... Uh, uh, I think it's a very common... Uh, this is the, I was very proud when I started drawing these diagrams. But this is like baby diagrams. And then I, I showed some people, oh, look at this diagram. <laughs> uh, no, I think this is a typical commuting diagram. <laughs> uh, okay. And now, well, maybe let me write it in a different color. But for example, you could write a circle monoid. And the changes would be here, what? here, and that's it. Okay, and then you know various shapes of circles, and this is where the generalization comes in. So in order to make, and then okay, maybe let me uh, uh, write what a homomorphism is. Okay. Of so far here. Suppose I have two algebras. Okay. 
So here I write the index what, because I would have two multiplication operations. Okay. And let me do it for star, but it doesn't really matter. And I have a second one. So what is a homomorphism from one to the other? Well, a homomorphism from one to the other is a function from the universe of one to the universe of the other, which has a property that if I... Why doesn't this happen to you guys? I saw a video of this... Uh, his name. This MIT professor of physics who's like has million YouTube videos uh, with the pendulum and stuff. And what he watch eleven. What he can do is he can draw a dotted line like so if you put the chalk at the right angle and you press it with the right pressure, uh, at least that's what he says. <laughs> but I try to do it and it doesn't work for me. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I was. <laughs> yes, I guess so. <laughs> so the commuting diagram is this: that I have a decomposed word, and I can either multiply it in the source monoid, and then apply the homomorphism, or I can apply it letter by letter. and then multiply it afterwards. Now, it so happens that for normal monoids, we only need to check this for uh, special examples, namely pairs of the form, um, like uh, words of length two and words of length zero. <laughs> That's enough, and then it, it generates everything. But if you wanted to write it like this, you could write it like this. That's a homomorphism. The notion of a Yes. Mm. So I would maybe erase these circles. Okay. And now we want to have different notions of star, and we want to draw these diagrams and maybe other diagrams as well. And uh, what do we need to have? What are the? What should our s star package? Star library supply. What's the API? Okay. Are these two diagrams independent? Yeah. I think so. Yes. There is no way to say a monoid is something, something. You know, when you're doing diagrams, there's no way. You can never say there's no way because surely it's like, or is the left can extension of something or of whatever. But not that I know of. <laughs> But there will be some dependencies in a moment. Dependencies that I know of. Multiplication is homomorphism for this. Course. Sorry? Yeah, so this means that multiplication is a homomorphism if you take uh, any star as, as a Yes, that 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 that, that is I think uh, is it true? Yeah, but they should be oriented a different way then. They should be flipped 90 degrees or something. Yeah, I think you're right that this is saying that uh, 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 there, uh, uh, yeah, I withdraw. But let's, let's, let's forget that for a moment. So, in order to draw these diagrams, which are in, indeed, I think, dependent, but I don't want to. Mm -hmm. What should you have? Well, first of all, well, you should know what star means, yes? So, for each set, M you should answer what does it, what's the star? What are the st structures? That, uh, uh, I will uh, I will call these structures over M. 
over labels. So you should think of it, it as inputting an, a set of labels and outputting the structures labeled by that. No, that's, that's very basic. One thing that is important is you need to have the flattening operation. You should say how do you take a structure of structures and how do you flatten it. This you should give to draw this diagram. That's part of your API. Okay. Another thing that you should do is you should be able to lift functions. Maybe here is the most clear one, H star. You should be able to pointwise apply it. So if you have a structure over some alphabet and you have a function from that alphabet to that different alphabet, you should be able to relabel your structure pointwise. Like some kind of a natural transformation. Of course. <laughs> well, this is, just a, this is just a functor so far. So for each function h, there should be some way to lift it to the star. You know what should be the title of this lecture, Nikolai? Sorry? The title of this lecture should be Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> uh, now, there's some other stuff that's left, which is maybe not completely apparent here. Uh, item one in the definition of monoid. Item one says, that if you take a one letter word, then nothing happens to it. So you should give in abstract the notion of a one letter word. So for each alphabet, you should give a function which interprets every letter as a one letter word. And this is typically called the unit. Okay. And therefore, axiom one becomes, you can, we can make it into a commuting diagram now. It just says that uh, if I take It should say that this is the identity. And now, maybe we will not call it a sigma monoid, we'll call it a sigma algebra, a star algebra, because that's more consistent with classical terminology. So the, the lower back blackboard contains the vocabulary that is necessary in order to define the upper blackboard. Okay? Now for these definitions to make sense, you should not only provide these things, but they should be subject to some axioms. I will draw one or two of them. So one axiom is that if I take a function, I take two functions and I can lift them, then lifting and then uh, composing should be the same thing as composing and then lifting. Yes. So it should be the case that if I go from M star, so suppose I have two functions, maybe So this is their composition, so it's H circle G. It should be the case that if I lift this, compose it with the lifting of this, it's the same thing as lifting this. So lifting and composing should commute. So something like
If you do this, then an alternative way should be to do this. This should come. Okay. That's one axiom. So, for example, if you take these two things, subject to this axiom, what is it called? Unless I forgot one axiom. Uh, what is it called? It's a functor. So, this is category theory uh, terminology. You have, it's a functor from the category of sets to the category of sets. Good. Mm. Then there should be some natural, I, I don't, I'm not, don't know if I said the right thing. Uh, there should be uh, some other axioms. I will, I will just draw, write a random subset of them, okay? Uh, another one that you might want to have is uh, something like this. Mm. Unit and flat should somehow be consistent with each other. Consistent with each other. So one way to view it would be something like this. If I take a unit in A star, and then a unit again, over a bigger alphabet. And then I flatten it. Yeah, maybe this one was not necessary. I don't know. Then you should have the same thing as a unit. So you write a number of things like this. Uh, just, I never remember the axioms <laughs> uh, that are supposed to be there. It's just, you know, whatever is natural, whatever works for a star is the axioms, okay? Okay, maybe one important one. And then we'll go for the break. This is the, the one that's hardest to understand. I mean, is, is there a notion of completeness here? The right set of axioms? I think so. Uh, I will. I will explain in a moment. But let me just give one of the more more interesting, the, the, the most the most important axiom here is the following. And unfortunately, it's going to be uh, it's going to be long. So it says if I take a set X, I think I use my set X, my set is sometimes called X, sometimes M, sometimes A. It, there's no no method in this change of names. Okay. It's not supposed to signify anything. Now I use this. Okay. And in the end, I can go here in two different ways. I could flatten it inside. So I could flatten this parenthesis inside, yes? Okay. And then flatten it once again. Or I could view this as my alphabet and flatten it outside. and then flatten once again. And the axiom is that this commutes. Okay? Now, there's a different way of viewing this axiom, which is as follows. If you think about it, and in conjunction with, I think, the axiom, one of the axioms I just erased, consider the following structure. The universe is x star, the algebra. I'm defining an algebra now. Okay? The universe of the algebra x, x star. And what is the multiplication operation? Yeah, flattening. So the, it takes 
this is my multiplication operation. Okay. And what this axiom says, it's just the instantiation of axiom number two. It just says that this is an algebra. Okay? So that's like a natural thing that allows you to have the, it's, it's also called the free algebra. Okay? So there's a number of axioms. So you provide these four things, and then they are subject to like 10 or 15 axioms, which if you are conversant with category theory, can be reduced to, I think, three words or something, saying it's like a monoid in the category of endomorphism or something. But it's a, it's a, you can either list them explicitly, but it, there's, there's various reasons why it's, 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 a, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a short thing, okay? And such a thing is called a monad. So a monad is some upper, some, these four things. So it inputs a set, it provides a set of structures. It shows you uh, how to lift functions from alphabets to structures. It shows you how to flatten structures of structures into structures. And it shows you how to interpret individual labels as basic structures. Subject to 10 or 15 axioms, it's a monad. With the multiplication operation? No. That's the bottom type part of the back. Now, once you have a monad, you can say, what's an algebra in that monad? So now the upper blackboard says, an algebra in the monad star is this. So once star is an algebra, once star is a monad, I have the sufficient vocabulary to define what it means to be an algebra in the monad. And assuming that the maxims are satisfied, not only is the definition well formed, but it has reasonable properties. And such an algebra is called, um, formally speaking, it's an Eilenberg Moore algebra for the appropriate monad. So now what we're going to do after the break, which I apologize sincerely for, for delaying, I'm going to give you like a large number of uh, monads. And each time I will be just waving it's a monad. I'm not going to check the axioms. And then you will see that the algebras are exactly what you want them to be. Okay?